Good afternoon, everyone. Oh, it works. Good afternoon to everyone. Bonjour à tous. Nous sommes ravis uh, de vous être ici avec nous aujourd'hui pour, pour uh, cette discussion très intéressante et pour le lancement de ce livre. We're really thrilled to have all of you with us today um, on this grey afternoon where we're going to have a bright and um, insightful conversation. We're really thrilled for you to be with us today. The Global Centre is really grateful and, and honoured to, um, to be hosting this book launch for Cross-Border Cosmopolitans, The Making of a Pan-African North America by Wendell Nilay Ejete, sat with me here. For those of us in the room today, you will have seen that we have the books available for purchase and for autographing by the author after the discussion today. And for those of you online, um, you don't miss out. Octopus Books, who are our partner for the launch, will have the book available in the online store. And I think we're gonna be posting a link to that in the chat. You'll have to track Wendell down somewhere to get him to autograph it for you, but at least they'll be able to order, to order the book. Um, the book really uniquely and ambitiously maps the scope of Pan-Africanisms in North America using a continental framework to examine 20th century Black liberation movements. We're particularly pleased to be hosting this event for cross-border cosmopolitanisms um, during Black History Month and, and wanted to acknowledge this as, as really a time to acknowledge, learn, and celebrate the legacy of Black people, communities, and excellence something we do all year round, but of course, again, um, really pleased that this is happening during, during Black History Month. I'm really excited about this, this discussion, and you know, when we first began to talk with Wendell about um, the launch of the book, you talked about how pluralism was a sort of a thread that had run through some of your research, and we were fortunate to have um, Wendell speak with us um, on a panel during the pandemic when none of us could be in the room together. Mm -hmm. And um, you said something that we often quote, mm -hmm. that pluralism is an instrument and an attribute of justice. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really centers the, the, the work mm -hmm. and the thought for, for all of us. Mm -hmm. At the center, we really believe that pluralism requires action mm -hmm. to positively respond to diversity. We're very conscious that this does not happen by itself. Mm -hmm to embrace diversity as a strength in our societies rather than something we need to manage or overcome. Mm -hmm. We need pluralist thinking, we need leadership, mm -hmm. we need pluralist systems and institutions, and these don't just happen. They really require considered thought, scholarship, mm -hmm. and action. So we're particularly pleased to see all of these things coming Absolutely. together today. And the ethic of pluralism is really embedded throughout the pan-Africanism that you describe in the book. And so we're really looking forward to hearing more about that. We're also really grateful to be presenting this with the In Spirit Foundation, which is an organization based in Toronto. Many of you, I'm sure, will know them, and they're very close, I think, Wendell, to your heart as, okay. as well. So I'll be handing over to our friends at In Spirit in just a moment to introduce you a little bit more and probably embarrass you with your long resume. <laughs> Um, but I wanted to first um, just remind us that we are gathered here on the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. We will be raising the blinds in a minute um, for you to see, but just to remind us, we are sat on the banks of the Kichisibi, the Great River, which has been a point of connection and gathering for centuries. It's also, of course, been a point of dispossession and violence against the First Peoples of this land. And these cycles of connection and gathering of building bonds and forging trust juxtaposed with cycles of violence and dispossession are i think really stark reminders to us as we reflect on this history as we have this conversation with you today and remind ourselves of our own responsibility to act towards reconciliation um, we had an extraordinary event last year with um, an educator and young leader from the Kitagon ZB First Nation, and she reminded us that it's our responsibility to collectively build back the broken bridge. And I think that's something that, that sits with all of us, and I know mm. that our own commitments towards reconciliation with Indigenous peoples will really be something that we're all reflecting on and, and framing even as we, as we speak mm. about, about your work and your book and, and the connections that we that we make there. So I am now going to hand over to Mitchell Anderson, who I see on the screen, um, who's joining us via Zoom in order to say a few words and to introduce Wendell. So uh, Mitchell, over to you. 
Thank you so much. Uh, and as said, my name is Mitchell Anderson, uh, and I'm a chair of the board at the In Spirit Foundation. And I'm joining you today from the city of Saskatoon uh, in the territory of Treaty 6, the homeland of the Métis Nation and the Dakota. And uh, I'm on the not far from the shores of a different river, uh, the Kisiskatchewan CP, the river who moves swiftly, uh, where people have gathered for uh, since the end of the last ice age, at the very least, if not much longer, uh, in this place, uh, making our making our home, including my ancestors. Uh, I uh, come to this question of pluralism uh, rooted in my own identity as an indigenous person. I am a Denisufane, one of the indigenous nations who make our home in what is today Saskatchewan. Uh, and I'm excited to be introducing uh, my friend, Wendell. The word for friend in a Denisufane is a setsene, uh, and uh, that, like many words in, in many indigenous languages, is a relational word. Uh, you can't be a friend in the abstract. You have to be someone's friend. So the su in Sitsene is my friend, or maybe another way would be Nuhitsene, our friend, uh, Wendell. Uh, and that sen in the middle of the word is help. That a friend is someone with whom we exchange help. And I just need to begin by acknowledging the, the intellectual help uh, I've received and moral and ethical help I've received from Wendell uh, in my own uh, personal and, and professional journey in pluralism, that um, how much uh, Black and Indigenous struggles for justice and inform and inspire and learn from and contribute uh, to one another. And that's uh, been, uh, I think, one of the deepest learnings for me as it relates to pluralism and one that uh, Wendell has really just inspired in me in so many ways. Uh, in Spirit is a foundation all about pluralism. Uh, it's at the heart of our mission and mandate. And in many ways, we've been informed and inspired by the Global Center. Uh, that, that word doesn't show up in too many places, uh, but it's, it's just so, such a captivating concept. And I really appreciate the, the sharing of, uh, around the connections between pluralism and justice. Uh, and it, it's an action. Uh, and so we, in, in this moment, seek to advance pluralism in a number of ways, including uh, working to combat Islamophobia, working to advance reconciliation, uh, and doing so through storytelling, through the media and arts, believing that when um, communities are able to tell our own stories rather than having stories told about us and share our stories with others uh, and hear one another's stories that, that we are changed, our communities are changed, and, and that's the, the entry point we have up to pluralism is through uh, narrative. Uh, and seeking to change and shift narrative power uh, in Canada. So uh, we've been just blessed to have Wendell uh, on our board. Wendell is a historian, a humanitarian. Uh, he has been at work on these questions of community and education and youth and combating uh, violence for years upon years and decades upon decades. He's one a list of awards that I, I uh, when I was prepping for this, uh, uh, Wendell's a humble person too. I, I didn't quite realize the depth of, uh, I'm not surprised, but just the depth of recognition that Wendell's received over his career, all incredibly well earned. Uh, and today he's assistant professor of post-reconstruction US history and the African diaspora and the North America and the Atlantic world at McGill, uh, where he also holds the William Dawson chair He's deeply committed to advancing pluralism, promoting economic progress and social change in North America and Africa, and divides his time between both the academic and humanitarian spaces in, in these locations. And uh, you're in for a treat. I, I will hunt you down, Wendell, and get a copy of that book side because uh, uh, I, am, I am just uh, so excited to uh, have another way uh, to, to learn from you and look forward to getting to see you face to face and give you a big congratulations for this enormous piece of work. You're all, you're all in uh, for a treat. And so uh, Meredith, I'll hand it back to you. Well, thank you so much. That was an absolutely brilliant um, introduction. And I hope you're suitably embarrassed as well. It's always good. Introductions are good when they, when they end up embarrassing you a little bit. Um, the, uh, the book is exceptional. And so I just maybe want to start. It's breathtaking in its scope and its ambition. 
Um, even beginning a project like that takes such extraordinary courage. Finishing a project like that is amazing. Um, so first of all, just a huge congratulations on the book. Um, groundbreaking, I think we think a lot when we think about pluralism about how can you frame things differently to get people to think differently, to begin to start seeing things anew. And, and I think you really do that so incredibly impressively and so well in this book. Um, especially the, as we were discussing earlier, you know, the continental focus that you take, the international focus that you take, really reminding us that we need to defragment mm -hmm. our understanding of these issues and not live only in our tiny nation state mm -hmm. bubbles. And so I was really hoping that you could start us off, first of all, talking a bit about how and why you embarked on this, on this project. Um, but then second of all, to talk a bit about how you see um, North American Pan-Africanisms contributing both to this wider scholarship mm -hmm. of African um, diaspora, mm -hmm. but then also about how that contributes to action around um, black liberation movements and, and activism today. So I'll pause for you. Wonderful. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes? Okay. Lovely, lovely. Um, thank you, Mitchell, for that uh, very generous introduction. Um, Mitchell is a, a very, very young man, but exceptionally talented, and he has the wisdom of someone who you might think is 80 years old. Um, he's just just a, a brilliant young man. Many thanks to you, Meredith, uh, Kalina, to Chanel, um, everyone at the uh, Global Center for Pluralism for coordinating this event. Uh, my name is Wendell Nilaye Ajiti. Uh, to my kinsmen and kinswomen on the African continent throughout the African diaspora, um, I'm also known as Ni Laye Osabu, the first Oblantai Manche of Atrikowi. Uh, and uh, first and foremost, I must uh, give due recognition um, and praise to the creator and the God of my ancestors, uh, the covenant of, of my ancestors, Osabu. Osabu Late, Ogidi Gidi, Begbete, Bete, Katamaso Tache, Gan Biache, Tuntache, Bochuku, Bonyaga, Bo Boami, Kedjo Sabua, Mokumoko Beg, Bo Bagbe. And I give thanks to the spirit of my ancestors. So, to your very provocative question, Meredith, the genesis of this book and of this project and the ideas behind Pan-Africanisms in a North American context. So, before embarking on my doctorate in 2012, August 2012, um, in the United States, I worked for several years in community development, um, but especially uh, gang intervention, youth gang intervention in North Toronto. Um, and I was working with friends, working among peers, um, some family members who were in that world of um, lack of opportunities, um, recid recidivism in and out of jails and prisons. And I had many, many questions um, regarding the life outcomes for black youth in particular, especially young black men, black boys and young black men. Um, and notwithstanding that I was embedded in these communities and this world, there was still so much that was enigmatic to me. I couldn't understand it. And so I was asking questions and, and asking my elders questions as well. And eventually my asking led me to pursue my doctorate, my PhD, to understand the history of African peoples uh, in the North American context. Why is it that often when we hear about gun violence in, in North America and urban places, it's usually uh, black youth? Uh, why is it that when we think about incarceration, you know, young black men are so grossly overrepresented? And so that's what precipitated some of the ideas behind the book. And having grown up with um, elders who were African Caribbean and African American and African Canadian uh, gave me a very rich experience of what the diasporic African experience was all about um, and how African peoples of various backgrounds had imagined something that was unifying and something that was life giving um, in terms of uh, their experiences here in the United States and Canada and the Caribbean and across the Atlantic. And so pursuing this project and then writing this book on, on Pan-Africanism in North America, I was preoccupied with uh, one principal objective, how and why 
notwithstanding everything African peoples, Black people have endured over the past um, several centuries in the Atlantic world, how and why the people of various ethnicities, nationalities, origins, religious traditions, um, cultural traditions, how and why did they come together to imagine a Pan-African community and a Pan-African movement? And so in my book, I, I deploy this term of Pan-Africanisms, the, the plurality, that Pan-Africanism has a global component, which I reference with a capital P, and a, a component that is rooted in notions of nationalism uh, and statecraft. And then there's Pan-Africanism with a lower P, which is very much the day-to-day -day practices of how people are able to live and able to resist and able to cross borders and forge connections uh, how they're able to inspire, how they're able to um, create opportunities uh, that might mitigate the effects of anti-Black racism. And so these ideas in terms of uh, Pan-Africanism on the ground, in grassroots terms, or Pan-Africanism in terms of uh, global and international affairs um, illustrated just the genius of Black resistance. It illustrated um, a culture of, of a culture of, of persistence, a culture of, of pursuing liberation that comes out of uh, en enslavement, right? And imagining something new and something wholesome uh, for African peoples throughout uh, the Atlantic world. And so part of uh, my objective, uh, in addition to uh, chronicling this history and piecing it together, part of my objective is to inspire uh, not just historians, but other scholars uh, to investigate what Pan-Africanism looks like from a continental perspective. And so when we think about these big ideas, naturally, people often think about the United States because it has a, a critical mass of African-American peoples, Black peoples, diasporic peoples, in the United States, seldom do people think about Canada ever. Uh, sometimes people think about the Caribbean, but not in a comprehensive way. And so I thought if we frame this phenomenon of Pan-Africanisms from a continental perspective, we get the US perspective, we get the neglected Canadian perspective, we get the overlooked Caribbean perspective, but invariably that forces us to understand North America and black people in North America within the context of the hemisphere, right? And now you'll have um, notions of what uh, the Black experience is like, even in Latin America, for example, right? Um, and other jurisdictions where people aren't just speaking English or maybe French, they're speaking Spanish, they're speaking Portuguese, they're speaking Dutch, they're speaking Creole, different types of admixtures of, of uh, African languages. Uh, but then you have the transatlantic com uh, component and the global component. And so we see that through this vehicle of pan-Africanisms, we can, we can harness, synthesize, even harmonize uh, a global Black experience. Um, you know, it's, it's so interesting because we are doing quite a bit of work in Colombia. And um, Mitchell, to your point about the connectivity between um, Indigenous justice movements and, and Black movements there, you see a lot of um, con connectivity and co-creation between Afro-descendant movements in, in Colombia and Indigenous movements. And, and I think exactly what you say, what you're doing is helping us move beyond the fetters of narrow notions of narrative of history that we've been taught and kind of helping us to unlearn some of those narratives in order to see this in its totality, which is just so exciting. I'm also conscious it's huge. And so I wonder um, for, for our, our guests, and that if you might want to pick for us a couple of really core stories. You talk mm -hmm. about the genius of the Black experience. Mm -hmm. You talk about inspiration and, and these amazing um, things that you're uncovering through your really extensive research. So maybe you can tell us a couple of the stories that particularly sure. resonated for you. Sure. So there are many stories and, and various vignettes or microbiographies uh, to which I reference in the book. Um, one prominent person that comes to mind, and I, in fact, I use her experience as a point of entry uh, 
and as an oeuvre of sorts to launch the book uh, in my introduction, her name uh, was uh, Juanita de Shield. Uh, Juanita de Shield uh, was a, a star student, uh, undergraduate at McGill, the first um, uh, person of African descent, first black woman to graduate from McGill College uh, in the 1930s. She was very much rooted in the black community in Montreal. Uh, she was a, a budding Pan-Africanist. She was an intellectual. She was a cross-border cosmopolitan. Um, she was engaging black communities in, in uh, the United States and Harlem in particular, uh, a place where she spent uh, many years uh, among family, among kin, among friends, um, writing about militarism and, and uh, anti-fascism and pan-Africanism. This is a, a young woman who's like 22 years old, like 21 years old. And I can't imagine being that intellectually mature when I was 21. I, I certainly wasn't doing that kind of work. Um, and so I was just so fascinated when I came across her just randomly in the archives, I came across her, some of her writings, and I thought, my goodness, I am not merely projecting some concept onto people, like sometimes it's easy to do as, as scholars, these individuals literally embody this notion of cosmopolitanism, right? Uh, they might be local actors, but they're always global thinkers, right? Um, in terms of just her engagement with anti-fascism um, and, and pan-Africanism, um, her rootedness in the Montreal community, but throughout Canada, uh, she was engaged with uh, um, uh, what was a, a black youth um, secretariat of sorts that was petitioning the government here in the United States for better treatment for, for people of African descent. Um, I think of uh, an educator, a young educator named Beulah Cousins, another person who comes out of the Great Depression, right? And of course, the Great Depression was this harrowing moment, but it doesn't at all hamper people's creativity, their commitment, uh, their commitment to African peoples, the liberation of, of African peoples. And Beulah Cousins um, was born to a white mother, a black father in what is Chatham, Ontario, so close to the Detroit-Windsor border. She's an educator, but she is also defying boundaries in ways that really just disrupt how we think about gender norms, right? And so I often argue that Pan-Africanisms is not something that men do, it's something that Black people do, right? And they do it, um, they do it uh, equally, they do it in a complementary uh, manner. And so Beulah Cousins is engaged in, in a, a local sort of grassroots cross-border component of, of Pan-Africanisms. And she and her, her girlfriends on weekends would travel to Cleveland or Detroit and other US cities. And they're educators by day. Um, on the weekends, they had this robust network of um, the biggest jazz musicians of the, of the, the century in the United States, um, like athletes, hustlers, um, individuals whom we would consider, um, you know, like, uh, crime bosses, but they weren't engaged in, in the type of uh, crime that we might think of, but they're engaged in what they call number running. So this is the underground lottery before the government sanctioned it and then took all the revenue from black communities. Uh, but they're engaged in this process of, of community building, right? Transnational community building uh, in the United States and Canada, across the pond in Europe, in Mexico. Um, and so we see in very intimate ways what life looked like when, in, when Black people are able to imagine freedom beyond borders, right? And what that entails in different jurisdictions. I think of, of Roosevelt Douglas, uh, who was um, a teenager, 19 year old, on this tiny Eastern Caribbean island in Dominica. And he wants to come to Canada. He comes from sort of the island bourgeoisie, right? He wants to come to Canada to study agronomics, like agriculture and, and economics at Guelph, um, the institution that would become Guelph University. And so like a lot of African peoples in the Caribbean and on the continent, uh, Canada was an especially unwelcoming to members of the Commonwealth because they were black. And so this very intrepid 19 turning 20 year old young black man in the Eastern Caribbean in Dominica, a place where most people have probably never heard of, he picks up the phone. Again, as I mentioned, he's, his class status, he's, he's very elite um, compared to others on this island. And he asks the operator to connect him to the prime minister's office. 
Right, and this is circa 1959, 1960, and it's Diefenbacher, Diefenbaker, who's, who's prime minister. And Diefenbaker, right, his anglicized name um, sort of disavows a German origin story, right? But Dief is very clear in his, in his memoirs. He had a hell of a time growing up, World War I, World War II, with a German sounding name, and that he knew what discrimination racism was. And this is somebody who would go on and defend the rights of Japanese Canadians, indigenous Canadians, right, indigenous peoples. And so he calls Diefenbaker's office. He leaves a message with the secretary. Dief calls back the island and says he wants to speak with this lad, Roosevelt Douglas. And so within a week after speaking with the prime minister, uh, Douglas is like, I keep applying for a student visa and no one's, no one's giving me a response. No one's facilitating my admission to Canada. Dief makes it happen. Roosevelt Douglas arrives in Canada, becomes a, like one of the most prominent student activists. McGill, uh, Sir George Williams, what would become Concordia University, eventually becomes one of the most important black power figures and sort of global revolutionary Pan-Africanist. He's deported back to the Caribbean. I mean, it's just a fascinating history of, of his contributions to the African diaspora as well. <laughs> that's extraordinary. That's a that's a great um, story that everybody should be hearing this this month, especially. Um, you mentioned cosmopolitanism, mm -hmm. and um, I think in the introduction of the book, I'm going to start quoting you. Too, sure. I hope you don't mind. Um, Pan Africanisms evoked cosmopolitanism. Cosmopolitan communities truly remain deeply interdependent and universal in espousing an ethic of belonging and mutual respect in the African diaspora and Africa. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk a lot about mutual respect and belonging when we talk mm -hmm. about pluralism. And His Highness the Aga Khan has talked a lot about co the cosmopolitan ethic mm -hmm. as really a foundational piece related to pluralism. And so I was wondering if you could draw those threads together for us mm -hmm. about looking at Pan-Africanism and pluralism and how you see those connecting. Absolutely. Pan-Africanism and, and cosmopolitanism go hand in hand. The beauty is that cosmopolitanism is not something that is confined to elite spaces, right? Cosmopolitanism is accessible to all human beings. It really is an ethic, right? And so uh, one of my favorite passages, and I, I reference it, I cite it in the introduction of the book, um, the individual who's often credited as the first sort of professional historian uh, in the African-American tradition, uh, George Washington Williams, he was the one who actually was traveling to Africa, was traveling on the African continent in like the 1880s thereabout, and witnessed what was happening in Leopold's Congo, the genocide of Africans in, in the Congo Basin. And he was the one who alerted the world. But Washington, uh, George Washington uh, Williams, Williams uh, referred to Africans and African peoples as being, since antiquity, a cosmopolitan people. Now, what does he mean by that? So most Africans, um, I'm an exception of sorts, uh, most Africans and Africans on the continent, the diaspora, uh, are very multilingual. I only speak uh, two languages, like most of my, my family members, my parents speak three, four languages easily, right? Uh, my loved ones from um, the Caribbean, et cetera, they know multiple languages as well. So multilingualism is an aspect of cosmopolitanism. Um, Cosmopolitanism also um, uh, refers to notions of, of religious tolerance as well, right? And we know that in, throughout the African continent, um, and historically and, and traditionally among African peoples, uh, religion or spirituality has a very syncretic element. There's elements of borrowing from here, borrowing from here, adapting this, adapting that, um, and again, these are, are ways that human beings facilitate bridges to other communities, right? Um, and, and mitigate the effects of um, the threat of difference, right? And of course, there, since you know, ancient times, there have always been very um, uh, robust sort of trading networks uh, connecting various communities and various peoples. And so when I think about cosmopolitanism and, and, and Pan-Africanism, I'm, I'm reminded of a practice that predates contact with European peoples or uh, peoples in sort of the Euro, uh, Eurasian uh, plateau. And that cosmopolitanism 
is a, is a feature of, of African life, of Black life that helped African peoples um, fashion new identities, create uh, new ways of, of brokering understanding. Mm -hmm. I love that, and I think it's a it's a real reminder as well of the evolutionary nature mm -hmm. of um, identities and connections. And like you say, spirituality borrows from different mm -hmm. spaces and different places, and and we all do that over over generations, multiple generations. And it's so Absolutely. important to not not imagine ourselves as static in Absolutely. any of this. I wonder if we can um, sort of move up to today a little bit mm -hmm. and just thinking about um, you know the 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 public outcry and, and maybe um, long overdue public recognition mm -hmm. um, of the um, of the issues of violence against black people, particularly mm -hmm. um, looking at at um, uh, violence by police services and others in, in, in the last several years and um, and thinking about a, a growing understanding, we hope, um, about uh, the effects of anti black racism and, and the systemic nature of, of that. Mm -hmm. And as a historian, um, I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about how how you see both this book and this idea of really understanding um, the Pan-Africanisms in this wider space as historically helping to inspire different types of action mm -hmm. and approaches today. So how do you see the history framing mm -hmm. new approaches today? Mm -hmm. Excellent uh, provocation, uh, Meredith. So, at the beginning of my remarks, I noted that I was working in youth gang prevention and intervention at the time in, in North Toronto, uh, and the huge disparities, the racial and gender disparities that I was seeing um, among my own friends and peers, but also just in the general public, um, that was mirrored by things that were much more foreboding in the United States, of course, and in different parts of, of the hemisphere. And so one of the, the main discoveries in, in the book um, and the very complex history behind it is that the types of gang violence and the way that it's particularly racialized, um, the types of uh, over-incarceration of, of black boys and young men um, and high death tolls as a result of um, antisocial, uh, quote unquote, antisocial behavior, et cetera. These are phenomena that come out of state repression, especially in the 1960s and 1970s, that the US federal government and the national security intelligence apparatus and the Canadian federal government and its national security intelligence apparatus would literally, right, this, this is empirically backed up and substantiated in my book, that they would rather have black boys and young men who engaged in antisocial behavior, i.e. gang banging, drug trafficking, um, school dropout, rather than them engaging in pro-social behavior, such as community organizing, right? Building institutions, what the elders in the community were training the youth to do. And so these efforts to pro, uh, these pro-social efforts, um, the state infiltrated, disrupted, sabotaged them. Uh, leaders in the United States in particular were outright neutralized, i.e. eliminated, i.e. assassinated. And this is not conspiratorial. We know this for a fact. I mean, one of the most prominent, aside from Malcolm X and Martin Luther King was Fred Hampton, right? We know for a fact the FBI colluded with local police, Chicago police, to execute this 21-year-old black man who had the brilliance, just the raw brilliance, brilliance of somebody who had multiple Ivy League degrees, but he grew up in the hard knocks and had a love for African peoples. Didn't just love black people, he was working with poor white people, he was working with indigenous peoples, he was working with Puerto Ricans, he was working with anyone who had been marginalized by the state apparatus. And so we see after his assassination and of course the political imprisonment of uh, a whole generation of young men, again in particular, um, and of course the exiling of, of those who couldn't be killed or uh, outright neutralized, uh, we see the, the proliferation of gang activity 
in, in various spaces from Chicago to LA to Toronto, et cetera. And I, I, I map this out in, in, in um, chapter five of, of the book. And so the history that I uncover and the history that I chronicle, I, first of all, don't think any society should be ashamed or scared or reticent to look in their past, right? This is part and parcel of what it means to be a people, right? And certainly in pluralistic societies. Um, but this is a history that should remind us um, and to help us disrupt notions of anti-Blackness, right? That when we see in newspapers or on TV that it's mostly Black young men who are engaged in gang violence and gun violence, who are over uh, represented in terms of incarceration, that these are the effects not of Black people being somehow inferior or um, just more likely to engage in that conduct, it's that the system from the beginning was set up in that way because the powers that be actually thought um, when Black communities engage in constructive forms of Pan-Africanism um, and resistance and activism and organizing, that they would expose the very real shortcomings, the violence of the state. And so this is a history that um, has capacity if it's engaged in good faith and it's engaged critically, it has the capacity to help us heal our wounds. Uh, and without which uh, it will be very difficult for us to build on our pluralistic foundations. We can't heal the wounds if we don't understand them. Precisely. Which is so key. So you've, you've mentioned something. So I have two more questions and I promise I'm going to let you all ask questions. Um, but before I move on to Canada, which I did want to get to, we were talking as well about the move, the very um, deliberate moves through counterintelligence and, yes. and sort of counterinsurgence, in, in, in a sense, by the state mm -hmm. in order to disrupt and destroy Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. and, and you talk about this a lot in your book. So I was wondering if we can maybe go there before we talk sure. a little bit about Canada and just really um, to speak to that, but also to ask you the question of this legacy of pan-africanism today mm -hmm. so you talk about the suppression by the mm -hmm. state in in the book but what do you see as the possibilities mm -hmm. for pan-africanism today mm -hmm. the legacies and, and the possibilities today so the black population in canada uh, we have african peoples in this country who predate the state itself right who are much older than canada um, and certainly if you go to places like Eastern Canada and in Nova Scotia uh, in particular, or Southwestern Ontario, parts of, of uh, the prairies, um, there are uh, Black people who trace their lineage to uh, the Caribbean and certainly to the African continent. So the Black experience is, is very pluralistic, right? It is very diverse uh, in so many fascinating ways. Um, but yet we see Black communities across this country um, forging connections nationwide, uh, forging cross-border connections with the United States, uh, forging uh, and maintaining real connections throughout the hemisphere, in the Caribbean, parts of Latin America, um, and certainly across the Atlantic as well. And these are, these are very real and living legacies of Pan-Africanism. We see um, Black communities as well engaged in the process of uh, anti neocolonialism. We see uh, Black communities throughout uh, Canada and uh, the United States uh, supporting uh, anti um, neocolonial efforts in a place like IET and what well, is Haiti, right? And, and the various uh, forms of repression and, and state uh, or imperialism in Haiti. Uh, again, these are very real living legacies of, of Pan-Africanisms. Um, most importantly, though, we see that uh, even in the pursuit of racial justice, uh, in the pursuit of uh, providing um, greater opportunities for Black communities to exercise self-determination, uh, black organizations naturally, almost instinctively, are looking across the border, right? And, and people in the United States are looking across the border here to find out what are the points of connection, right? What are um, kindred and comrades doing uh, in the respective places? What's happening on the African continent? 
Um, and so my experience of being born on the continent, having grown up in, in North America, spending time in the United States, traveling back and forth across the Atlantic um, is by no means unique. Um, and I see that in, in uh, black communities, black organizations as well. Uh, this ethic, this cosmopolitan ethic, right? You are, you might be locally engaged, but you're always globally focused and minded. Uh, notwithstanding who is Muslim, right? Who is Christian? Who is Jewish? Who is um, practicing their indigenous African identities, right? Um, all of that, and you know, who is, uh, regardless of their gender expression, who and um, regardless of class um, alliances, et cetera, et cetera, we see that um, uh, notions of, of, of blackness and, and belonging in the African diaspora subordinates all the other things so that it doesn't um, undermine uh, cohesion and, and, and a collective effort. I think it's an ethic we should all be aspiring to and, and learning from, which is, I think, one of the reasons the book is, is so powerful for, for all of us. So my last question, um, just before I open to the audience, is specifically around Canada. I know you look at this continental and international focus, but, you know, in Canada, we love to not be the United States, and we all know that. Um, and we like to sort of shield ourselves behind, I think you term it, the sort of myth of progressivism mm -hmm. in Canada. And so I am going to quote you to you sure. again, <laughs> because I think this is a particularly powerful passage that I just want to read from the book and, and then have you speak to us about this myth of progressivism and, and where it's holding us back in Canada. So in the book you say, in the pursuit of post-war human rights, the paradox of progress posits that the volcanic anti-blackness in the United States made Canada a society that had its own smoldering ashes of racism, but few black people, appear racially temperate. By embracing liberal internationalism and multilateralism and denouncing racism within the British Commonwealth and the United States, Canadian society emerged as an imperfect champion of non-white peoples. The Canadian government, in sum, sought soft power on matters of racial justice to court newly independent racialized countries and to portray itself as an alternative to the hawkish, racially divided United States. I really saw our Canadian foreign policy identity in that passage. Mm. It was so powerful to me to have that placed in that frame mm -hmm. and really to remind ourselves as well about this history mm -hmm. and what this is doing to really hold us back maybe from seeing ourselves and our own history. So I was wondering if you could maybe speak a bit to that before sure. we open to the audience. Sure. So to understand Canada, to appreciate the history of this country, this history's colonial roots, uh, its pre-colonial roots, uh, Canada as a, as a nascent dominion, and then Canada as a nation state and state and its foreign policy, uh, we have to understand Canada within the context of the British Empire uh, and a British Empire that post-1776 was in a very serious existential struggle with the United States, right? With another Anglo, a budding Anglo power. And Canada, a product of the British Empire, inherits this geopolitical legacy, right? And Robin Winks, who was a, a very prominent historian of the British Commonwealth, um, who actually predated me by a few years, several years before I arrived at Yale. Uh, Winks was a longtime historian there um, and has written throughout on the British Empire, but also in Canada. Winks wrote about uh, slavery uh, in the context of British North America, so what would become Canada and the United States. And he noted that abolitionism, for example, right, and the emancipation offered to enslaved Africans um, in the 18th century to the early 19th century that this was purely strategic. It was geopolitical to entice enslaved Africans in the United States to come northward to seek freedom in British North America or like Upper Canada, Lower Canada. It was a strategic move and to use his words to strike at the heart of the empire, the heart of the American Republic, right? To extract its labor force, its most lucrative assets, meaning African peoples. And so 
when we understand that context, we understand that British emancipation and the type of emancipation and the lore of the Underground Railroad, the lore of Canada as a, a refuge point, as a, uh, a safe place for enslaved Africans, for Black people, this is significant mythology, right? It is mythology that advances a very real, a very sort of real politic foreign policy, right? A foreign policy that is based on, it's, it's hawkish in some ways, but it's, it's based on soft power, notions of immense, uh, humanitarianism, right? Foreign policy based on British fair play and British justice, right? And these are ideas that Canada coming out of World War II with a British empire that is on its deathbed, a rising US empire that would become literally uh, you know, the dominant player in, in, in the Western world. These were, these were the, the narratives that Canada could deploy to gain a semblance of notoriety, a semblance of the honest broker vis-a-vis -vis Washington. And the fact that the United States was just so retrograde, right? And every day there are images of black people being terrorized, brutalized, um, experiencing the worst forms of injustice by sitting justices, right? And, and like state constitutions, et cetera, et cetera. It meant that our beloved society, and there are many things I love about Canada, many things I love because I have a stake in the society and African peoples have been here for a very long time. They've contributed to this society. Um, and I'm grateful to stand on the shoulders of, of said um, African peoples, said elders and, and ancestors. Um, but we, because of this geopolitical dynamic, Canada didn't have to do much uh, to look superior compared to the United States, right? Canada could do the bare minimum until Black communities, of course, said, no, 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 this is really bad. And they would take the train, the via, and, and come down to Ottawa and petition, you know, um, uh, prime ministers and, and, and federal ministers and, and point out how Canada had its own, and I use their words, a Jim Crow Iron Curtain, that this was very, this was a very racist society, right? Um, until, you know, Asian, Canadians of Asian descent, whether they're Japanese or Canadians, are, are also standing up. Um, indigenous persons are standing up. Uh, Canadians who are coming from Eastern Europe, who are Jewish, are standing up and saying there's a, there's a lot of racism towards Jewish people here. And so you see the various ways, not just Black communities. Black communities were very much prominent in that human rights struggle, but we see the various ways that other communities uh, force Canada and push Canada to engage in more than just the minimum of saying, well, the United States is very racist. We could just get by, you know, sitting on our laurels. Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, you know, I think it's sort of a thread in, in so much of what you've talked about also is that we have to understand these histories, mm -hmm. however difficult and complicated they are for our own identities and our own understandings of Canada and of North America and all of these spaces in order for us to build something better mm -hmm. and to be acting in these in these in these different spaces and in a way that builds a more pluralist society. So we've talked a lot i would love to hear um from uh, colleagues in uh, in the room if there are questions we have a microphone that'll be going around i think Claire. Yeah. hi um is it green lit is that on yeah good um, thanks, that was great. Um, my name is Belinda Dodson, and I'm the editor of the Canadian Journal of African Studies, mm -hmm. among other things I do. Okay. Um, could you tell us a bit more about the connections between the North American Pan-Africanism mm -hmm. that you very eloquently mm -hmm. and powerfully described and Pan-Africanism on the African continent itself, sure. both large P and small sure. P Pan-Africanism? Mm -hmm. And as a kind of addendum to that question, um, why you chose to use Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's great that you did, but it's clearly yes. a kind of provocation. So mm -hmm. if you could, yeah, just make that connection. So the latter part Thanks. of your question, why did I choose to use pan Why did you choose to use the term Pan-Africanism, which seems kind of provocative, because you know, you think Pan-Africanism, that's what African people in Africa, mm -hmm. being Pan-African, mm -hmm. maybe 
reaching outwards to the diaspora, but your story is very much a North American mm -hmm. story, it yes. seems to me. So why, you know, why did you pick that? Okay. What was the logic behind choosing that term? Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And your name one more time, please. Blinda Dodson. Blinda Dodson. Okay, thank you so much for your question. So the first part of your question in, in my introduction, so I periodized my book from 1900 to 2000, so covering just the long sweep of the 20th century, and even just a, a few decades uh, in the latter end of the 19th century. And so starting in 1900, I look at um, Sylvester, Henry Sylvester Williams, who was uh, sort of a founding father of, of big P pan-Africanism, of um, anti-colonialism and uh, independence, the independence movement. So he comes out of Trinidad, um, in the 1890s, very bright young man, very, very smart young man, travels to uh, New York and basically just hustling, trying to make ends meet so he could go to school. Things don't work out there. He crosses the border, enters Canada, working as a porter, basically, meets a white benefactor who writes a letter of recommendation for him. He goes to Dalhousie University. He's like the first black um, law student there. Before he finishes his degree, he makes some meaningful connections in, among the African Nova Scotian peoples uh, in Nova Scotia, crosses the pond, goes to the metropole to, to England, and then where he earns his, his, um, uh, his degree as a, as a lawyer. And so by 1902, he's in South Africa, South Africa proper, working with uh, the native population there. Uh, and supporting them, providing legal defense and supporting their rights to land claims and, and, and other forms of redress. By 1903, he had done so much work for the natives of South Africa, the Africans in South Africa, that he had effectively precipitated what would become the ANC, right? The African National Congress, which is a major um, entity in terms of anti-colonialism and, and, and the freedom struggle in South Africa. And so I, I use Williams as, as, a, as a point of entry to illustrate um, just how significant, to the latter end of your question, just how significant the diaspora, the African diaspora, those whose ancestors embarked via this genocidal process called transatlantic slavery, the Middle Passage, ended up in Barbados or Jamaica or Honduras or Trinidad or the United States or Canada. Um, and how they were, in fact, the precipitating agents for what we would know as Pan-Africanism. They're the ones who gain, as a result of their existential struggles um, uh, against white supremacy and enslavement, they're the ones who gain a hyper race consciousness, a hyper awareness of who they are as African peoples and trying to chronicle the African past to understand from whence they came. And so it is out of the diaspora, out of the Caribbean basin, out of the North American mainland. So I look at the Canada and the United States and Caribbean basin as being North America proper. It is out of this geographical area that Pan-Africanism gains a type of legitimacy, right? And certainly I, I actually cite extensively the experience that happened in, in Saint-Domingue, i.e. IET, and what Africans achieved, enslaved Africans achieved there from 1791 to 1803, which would birth this new the first black uh, republic, right? Um, and the first republic ever in the world that enslaved peoples created out of revolution, right? And so uh, just to answer sort of the, um, the diasporic element inspiring the continent, right? Um, and it was Haiti, in fact, that dispatched a delegation in 1896, 1896 to Ethiopia or Abyssinia, which had then defeated uh, Italy in a battle at Adwa, right, which sent shockwaves throughout the European world, shockwaves throughout the African world that these quote unquote primitive peoples had literally broken the backs of a, of a European power. And so Haiti sends this delegation and says, as a, as a nation that is firmly uh, rooted in, in the Pan-African, revolutionary Pan-African tradition, we want to support Abyssinia, we want to endorse the work you're doing. And so that diplomat who was summoned to pay homage in Abyssinia spent time here around like 1907, 1908 fundraising, spent time in Montreal and Toronto and New York, et cetera. And so these are true sort of cosmopolitan border crossing individuals. Um, 
Big P Pan-Africanisms really quickly. So in the 1960s, 1970s, as the civil rights movement and black power, so civil rights movement basically is promising integrationism. And at a certain point, even the integrationists like Martin Luther King is like, my goodness, I am leading my people into a burning house. Integrationism or pseudo integrationism is not going to provide us material security for the African-American masses. And so King is now very reluctant that integrationism clearly is not going to work. And so it is in that the midst of 19, 1965, 1966, that black power, right? Something that is much more militant, right? Much more assertive, unapologetic, not kowtowing, is not seeking integrationism as a gold standard of black liberation. It is at this time that black power emerges on the, the scene again. And of course, it is at this time that the government suppresses it uh, rapidly, right? And so when black power is up against the wall and leaders are being outright executed, um, exiled or imprisoned on just trumped up charges, there's a, an African-American gentleman named Howard Fuller. His African nom de guerre that he adopted is Owusu Sadoke. And Owusu Sadoke travels to uh, East Africa, to Tanzania, to Ethiopia, um, circa 1971. And he, in that process, he travels with other African-Americans. Um, and he's invited by Frelimo. And he is, yes, embedded with guerrilla forces who are fighting Portuguese fascism, white supremacy, colonialism, um, not in an abstract way with Kalashnikovs, women with babies on their backs, holding arms, like it is, it is an outright struggle for their existence. When Sadokai asked his African brothers and sisters, continental brothers and sisters, what can we in the diaspora do to amplify what you are all enduring? This is circa 1971. And they said, we need material support. We need arms, um, propagate our message that we want to be free, right? Uh, from uh, uh, the tyranny of, of Portugal, um, propagate our message, send us arms. If you can send people to fight with, in arms with us here, send them. And so Sadokai returns to the United States and he launches what they call African Liberation Day um, in Washington, DC, in Toronto, in San Francisco, in Antigua, in Dominica, um, Barbados, and so every May 1972, coinciding with uh, uh, the day celebrating um, the organization of Afro African unity, uh, there's African Liberation Day celebration. And so what happened, and I'm not going to give the book away, but let's just say, <laughs> uh, yeah, a three letter entity that is headquartered in Langley, Virginia, <laughs> caught on and then the rest is history and you'll find out in the book. It is absolutely bonkers. McGill University is involved. Canada is involved in very real ways. Um, there are, yeah, I won't say anymore. You have to buy the book. <laughs> That's a good cliffhanger, Wendell. Um, I'm sure there's other questions in the audience. There may be a question online as well. So I just wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity for our guests online. Um, if Kalina, did you want to read yeah, it? We're just going to take a question from the online Great. audience next. So we're just going to project them on the screen. No, we need to invite David Spence. Okay, I didn't realize I was uh, uh, next in line there. Thank you very much for the presentation. I'm from Vancouver Island, British Columbia, on the Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, where everybody has a, a sacred relationship of one sort or another. I find that uh, many of your comments uh, are very much in the context of them versus us, of a binary context of my way, but not your way, of imperialism as being the legacy of uh, the colonialism. And so I would like to ask the question, uh, what do you believe is the role of the modern Commonwealth 
in promoting the Afro-American experience of inclusivity, liberality, respectability, and plurality that is beyond the ancient British Empire experience of exclusion and slavery, discrimination, and white supremacy. Thank you. Thank you for your question. So the role of the modern Commonwealth, it's skeletal compared to what it once was, but the role of the modern Commonwealth in terms of promoting the interests of African peoples. Uh, well, first and foremost, African peoples demand self-determination, and this is what Pan-Africanism is about, self-determination, right? Um, that the material security of African peoples, uh, the resources of the African continent belong to the African peoples, not to European metropoles or Canadian metropoles or American uh, metropole. These are resources that belong to African peoples. So self-determination is first and foremost. We, we talk about colonialism and imperialism a lot. We seldom ever, ever, ever have frank truth and reconciliation like conversations or dialogue around the crimes of imperialism, the various forms of genocide that have taken place on African soil, um, whether it's Belgium, whether it's the British, whether it's Germany on, under the Kaiser, whether it is various administrations in Washington supporting all types of proxy wars on the African continent, we never really talk about those things. It's almost as if it's taken for granted. Yeah, these, there are some tragedies here and there, but the lives of African peoples, um, the labor of African peoples, um, the welfare of, of African peoples has been trampled, exploited, um, disavowed, um, desecrated in, in so many ways. And so honest dialogue, and again, society shouldn't be afraid to uncover their past um, because many of these societies still reap the fruits of things that have happened in the past. Um, and so this is very necessary. And certainly there's some dialogue around what reparative justice might look like, right? Especially if we're thinking about Commonwealth and, and um, uh, African peoples in, in the diaspora and the Americas, transatlantic slavery and this, this genocidal commerce that would put European metropoles on a trajectory for global domination, right? It wasn't Europe's brilliance, it was Europe's genocidal ex uh, resource extraction of the African continent and resource, I don't just mean gold and other minerals, I mean African flesh as well, has fueled um, the world order for at least a thousand years, right? How do we talk about that forthrightly um, and ensure that African peoples do get to exercise true self-determination? Mm -hmm. You know, when you and I spoke last year, you said something to me that completely changed the way I saw North America. And we were talking specifically in the context of the US and you said, the United States is a post-war society that never had any kind of reconciliation process. And I think it's again, back to this, the myth of Canadian progressivism and, and North American understanding, and you're of course speaking about it more globally as well, is that there has not been a truth and reconciliation process in these. There is historical discussion, but there isn't this concerted process that we see, and those of us who work in peacemaking espouse for every country that's undergoing conflict today, mm -hmm. but this conflict is continuing in different forms societally, as you as you so powerfully describe in the in the book. I think we probably have time for one more question from the audience. So I have one here. Kalina, you're the timekeeper, so you have to tell me if I'm allowed to take more than that. You're my boss. Please go ahead. Um, yes, sorry. Um, Dr. Wendell, Ajate, Akwaba. Thank you. Um, yes, it is gray outside, but you bring a freshness. Thank you, sir. An honest consciousness raising to Ottawa. Thank you. And I, I couldn't be anywhere else but here today. And I thank our ancestors from within yeah, and also yeah. across the ocean. Thank you. Um, my name is Chapman Uko. 
Um, born in Ghana, Ghana was known as Gold Coast, uh, Nigerian parentage, and raised in Canada. Um, I work just down the street called Asbury College. Mm -hmm. So I'm here to represent, um, uh, we don't like to use the word private school anymore. Independent. Independent or international or school, international. which is better. Um, growing up as a child back in Gold Coast, my father spoke of uh, Pan-Africanism back then, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, Yerere, Kahunda, Nazer of Egypt. There was a fight going on, an internal consciousness raising in Africa at the time. Just for you to clarify, when did that desire and the spirit, when was that fire put out? I'm happy you know that, that North America today, you and your uh, brilliant colleagues have now taken that, that staff to say, you know what, let's talk about Pan-Africanism. Mm -hmm. It was a desire, mm -hmm. it was a movement, mm -hmm. but somehow along the way, people interfered with self, um, what's the word, self, um, regulation or self-independence mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so again thank you so much are you familiar with um wilfred laurier yes yeah yes. he wasn't a good man no yeah he had no place for negroes to come to canada that's right we were unfit that's right because of climate mm -hmm. and we were unsuitable mm -hmm. how dare him how dare he how Indeed. dare him Indeed. Yeah. thank you Thank you so much, sir. And please remind me of your name again. And Chapman eloquence. Jojo Uko. Chapman Jojo Uko. Yes, also Great. known as Kojo. Also known as Kojo. Thank you so much, sir. Um, wow. The Pan-Africanism to which you allude that Nyerere and Nkrumah and Azikwe and, and, and others championed um, was very much of the lineage of a, a stout five foot six ebony hue Jamaican immigrant who arrived in the United States on the 23rd of March, 1916. Um, some of you might know him as Marcus Mosiah Garvey. Um, Garvey without a doubt, and there's a lot of bad history, and I, you know, I have some very brilliant colleagues who still write some really bad things, like just falsehoods about Garvey and, and his movement. But Garvey, if a, 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 um, an objective historian was to assess his legacy and his track record, was easily the greatest Pan-Africanist of all time and his, con his contributions to global Pan-Africanism. And it's Garvey who inspires Nkrumah and these other young African students studying the United States who return to the continent with this idea of a USA. And this is why Garvey was um, framed by the US government, sent to the prison, and then deported because he had the temerity to inspire in the hearts of African peoples, a United States of Africa and what that foreboded for the Western powers. The United States of Africa united under one flag, right, federated. And so you're, you were alluding to the Casablanca group uh, with Nasser and Nkrumah and other interlocutors who saw Africa without borders, Africa with states, but with a, a sort of a federated system, right, from north to south, from east to west. Um, an African continent that was a country with, with uh, federated states. And then there was the, the Monrovia block, which basically created the, the dynamics that we have today, right? With the uh, sort of present iteration of the African Union. So there was an organization of uh, African unity, and then it became the African Union. But the organization of African unity wanted the federated continental wide country, the Casablanca group, the Monrovia group won out. And so very much against the interest of Nkrumah and, and Nasser and, and, and others. And the, the detriment of that in the, in the early 1960s was that it made it much more effective, um, certainly for Washington, certainly for Brussels, certainly for Lisbon, 
certainly for London and Paris to pick apart these newly or aspiring independent entities on the continent, to pick them apart. Because what Garvey envisioned and what he imparted to Nkrumah and Nkrumah's cohort of, of liberators was that a united Africa under one flag means an African Navy, an African army, an African diplomatic corps, um, African resources that would transform the material conditions of ordinary African peoples, an African continent that would act as a beachhead for Black people whom Wilfred Laurier was saying, we don't want you here because the cold is too much for your Black skin, just idiotic nonsense. When Africans had been toiling on these lands to build riches for the British Empire, right? Utter nonsense. And so what Nkrumah visioned was that an African continent that would be a beachhead for everywhere Black people are located, if they're being lynched and terrorized and harassed, they have a principal benefactor that can protect their interests. But we've never had that. And so we have these atomized states, meaning the Monrovia group won out. Um, and the dream of Pan-Africanism was beautifully subverted, right? Surgically, surgically subverted, counter subverted. Mm -hmm. Wendell, I think we're gonna have to um, wrap up also because I know everybody wants to buy your book and get your autograph and continue the conversation outside of our coffee and tea. Just, I'm not gonna try and say anything in summation other than just to reflect on the power of the scope of your book, I think really helps people see beyond fragmented pieces of history to really try to understand these connections and understand the system. I think you were talking also about the need to understand the system that is leading to mm -hmm. the outcomes that we have today. And too often it is assumed that it is the order of things rather than really understanding right. the depth of history and all of this. And, and for me, I think that's just one of the really, really powerful and extraordinary pieces in, in your book, in addition to the fact that it's absolutely beautifully written. And, and we're really just, again, so grateful to have this opportunity to talk with you and to learn from you and, and to hear more about the book. So again, Wendell, thank you. Thank Merci, you. Chimigwech, and, and a huge thank you. Asante Nisana to all of you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you all. Yeah. Santa Sana. Yeah.